CataractCoach.com podcast series, episode number 52, with Dr. Dipinder Dhaliwal, incoming president of the ISRS. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast, and today we have a very special guest, one of my favorite ophthalmologists who teaches me so much and is not afraid to tell me like it is and poke a little bit of fun at me too. That is Dipinder Dhaliwal, professor at University of Pittsburgh, cataract cornea refractive specialist, also president-elect of the ISRS. Welcome, DP. Aw, thank you, Uday. I am truly honored to be here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now tell me about your work with ISRS because you get some big changes here. Oh yeah, ISRS is going to be bigger and better than ever. We are super excited to launch the next chapter of our career as a society. And you know, we're the oldest refractive surgery society uh, wow. in existence. We were founded back in the 70s by the true pioneers of refractive surgery like Jose Ignacio Barraquer, mm -hmm. Kaz Swinger, you know, all the Troutman, I mean, all these amazing names. And the important thing is that we were independent. We had a little bit of um, financial difficulty. So the academy was fabulous and they took us over for 20 years. And now we're ready to be independent again. And we started our independent phase on January 1, 2024. So now awesome. we are independent once again. And we thank the Academy for all their wonderful um, shepherding through through the past two decades. And, and really, it's been it's been a fun adventure to be on our own again. That's fantastic. So ISRS, International Society for Refractive Surgery. Are you going to have meetings then across the world? Tell me what's planned. When's the first inaugural ISRS standalone meeting? Well, where the hometown of Professor Barraquer. Wow. You know which, which town that is? Somewhere in Colombia. Uh, not quite. No. Barcelona. Oh, Barcelona. Oh, that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking something different. No, no. Well, he he practiced in, in, oh. in Colombia for many, many years, but his hometown is actually in, in Barcelona. So the ESCRS meeting is happening in, uh, in the fall. And we are so really, again, honored to have a collaboration with the ESCRS. And we are going to have a joint refractive summit on the Friday before ESCRS. So that's going to be our- I will have to meeting. sign up and attend. Absolutely. We are we are very, very excited and pumped about this new next phase. So we're just really uh, going to be nimble. We're going to be really responsive to our members. We still have the amazing member benefit of the JRS, the Journal of Refractive Surgery, and our website is isrs.online. So come visit. We will put a link down below for that, and we look forward to it. I definitely want to come to Barcelona. That's a fun time. Indeed. I'm sure Indeed. I'll learn a lot, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then the future meetings will be then just with kind of in combination with another big meeting like ESCRS or ASCRS or Academy. How are you going to plan that or not known yet? Well, where do you want the next meeting? Oh, they, they've gone. Let's go somewhere fun. Okay. Let's See, let's do it. You let us know. Like, this is the time. We are, we want to really listen to our membership and our membership is truly international. So we could go fun. We could do different continents. Like we are basically in so the plan. So we are international hundred percent. I think that's a better move for you guys. Instead of being, you know, kind of shepherding with the AAO, which was great for a while, but to break away and have your own separate meeting and then choose different countries because you are truly international. Absolutely. There you go. Well, then you know what? You got to do something in Asia. Okay. That'd you let us know. One. We're we're ready. We are you ready. You got to do Asia. You got to do South America. You got to do Europe. You, gotta, you just got to spread it all around. Uh, I, I think that's a fabulous idea. Those are ideas that we are um, talking about now. And again, we really want more participation, membership participation. So we're forming uh, really exciting subcommittees and really going to re-energize the society. I really look forward to being more involved then. So for a young ophthalmologist, our podcast skews towards the younger groups, 30s and 40s, our typical ophthalmologists who like to listen to our podcasts and watch our videos. 
what what how can they get more involved and how do they find out more we'll put the the website link down below what are the benefits for a young ophthalmologist i'm a let's say i'm a 30 something year old ophthalmologist just started to practice want to do more refractive surgery how, what's the benefit of joining your organization oh uh, what a great question Uday. so you know the starting a refractive surgery practice as you know right requires a lot of ecosystem you you right. can't just say i'm I'm fellowship trained in refractive surgery and I'm ready to go. No, you need you need business acumen. Mm -hmm. You need to understand who your ref referral sources are going to be. You need to understand the flow. You need to understand financing. You need to understand where are you going to do these amazing surgeries, right? Are you going to go to a surgery center? Are you going to buy that equipment? So the key thing is we want to help a refractive surgeon figure it all out and help them to be kind of the best version of themselves, whatever that looks like, whether it's private practice, academics, et cetera. So we are going to have different subcommittees. We're going to have different mentorship opportunities. And um, I, I think the critical thing is that by being a member of the OG Refractive Surgery Society, right. ISRS, you have the world's pioneers of refractive surgery the best business minds in refractive surgery as members. And the key thing is that when you come to, to meetings that are a little bit smaller on the smaller scale, you know, you can actually approach somebody like right. they, they have gone and ask him for advice, but you can actually just email and say, Hey, you know, I'm interested in this. I have some questions. Can you help me? And boom, you can get that. But we will have a young refractive surgeons oh, nice. committee so that we want to enable a young surgeon to actually grow in a society to to get more leadership experience and to get those roles we don't want to be like you know the the, the old fogies you know on the board forever. Uh -huh. no we don't believe in that at all so we want to have really shepherd our youth you, you know the 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 these generations they're our future right we want them right. to have the best foundation the best resources so they can really fly mentor the next generation and so you can eventually pass the baton to them absolutely absolutely that's what we're all about we are all about collaboration sharing teaching and so and even to the point of you know we have um these kind of mini fellowship tracks so if you just want to go and visit a surgeon uh, you know, I need to learn that fake it IOL a little bit more in, mm -hmm. in depth. Can I, you know, come and watch you in the OR? Sure. You know, that's that's gonna that's part of the benefits as well. Oh, that sounds fantastic. That's really neat. Yeah, I'll have to look into it a lot more and definitely want to be involved. How big do you think the meetings are gonna be? Like how many doctors do we expect as it that's yes? That's a good question. You know, I mean, we're we're not exactly sure yet. Um it's it's since it's our first foray into having our meetings internationally, right? We're not we're not a hundred percent sure of the exact numbers, but uh, the more the merrier, of course. And uh, we want to always, though, maintain the feeling of a smaller meeting because you yeah. know how valuable that is, right? Right, right, you know right. That that energy, that special kind of vibe that you sense when you're in a smaller meeting, right. where people yeah, yeah, are yeah. Just so excited to be there and you're, everyone's very accessible and everyone is there because they want to be there, right? They wanna For learn, sure. they wanna teach, they wanna share. So that's, we want, we don't wanna ever lose that vibe, but you know, we're gonna scale up and down as needed. And we have, a lot of sessions in in our partner sister and brother societies so that like for example in cartagena colombia we are going to have a meeting in i believe it is in august late august so one of our um societies uh the colombian society of refractive surgery is is hosting a session for refractive surgery and isrs is going to oh, for that. i will be at that meeting i've already been invited by their colombian society so I will be at, yes. Okay, so you'll be a part of our ISRS session. I'll be, yeah, I will be there in Cartagena. I'm looking forward to it. Perfecto, okay. Although when I go to, when I go to Spanish speaking countries, I speak my Los Angeles learned Spanish, which is yeah. very, very much a Mexican dialect. So it always throws people off like, wait a minute, are you, how do you speak Mexican Spanish? 
<laughs> it's a little bit different, right? It's like speaking British English versus Australian English or Amer American English. It's a little different. You know, it's all Greek to me, baby. So I don't know. No, I I, uh, I still am aspiring to learn Spanish. I think it's oh, such a beautiful language. language. You know what you love about it? It's so logical. They're like the same rules. Unlike English, where English is a little bit illogical and like you write it often differently than you'd say it. In Spanish, yes. you know, it's like, it's straight. <laughs> right it the way you say it it's all done it's no question the rules are the rules it's yeah. it's actually a beautiful language yeah no i i totally agree i can i'm um I'm trying to learn trying to learn and that's why i start really kind of emphasizing the the i part the international part which is yes. really great yes yes indeed indeed and i think that membership is so important especially because if you look now in your residency there's very very little refractive surgery i mean when i when i was a resident way back when I was the first resident at UCLA to ever do LASIK. And the reason why I was allowed to do it was my mentor, who's now the chairwoman at UCLA, was Ann Coleman. And she's a glaucoma specialist. And I just told her, Dr. Coleman, I'd really love to do LASIK. I think it's important that residents learn. And this is like 1997 or something, or eight. And I said, you know, would you go to bat for us residents with the department and make sure? And she did. She went to bat for us and she allowed, she made it so that we were allowed to do LASIK as residents. That is, patients. We did, I did four eyes. That's amazing. And you started with the mechanical microkeratome, yes. right? Oh my gosh, yes. Wow. Well, they, I, I knew you were brave and now your, and the, your image of, uh, you know, <laughs> my, my image of you has just elevated. If you, if you could use a mechanical microkeratome from those, from those days, right. the automated corneal shaper, right? The, that was the, one, the ACS, there are a whole bunch yeah, of different ones. The ACS. But, you know, the, yeah, the amazing thing was too, even the lasers were these older broad beam lasers. And so how did you treat astigmatism? That believe it or not, there was an ablatable mask that you put in front of the laser path, the laser beam that would help you treat the system. It was so amazing that we could do it back then. And it's so antiquated to what we're doing now. It's amazing. It, it truly is. But isn't it fun that we were there when it all started? I yeah, think that's yeah. what's so exciting is that we were part of refractive surgery at the very beginning of the FDA approvals of the eczema right. laser and of the, you know, all these different iterations of microkeratomes. And now, you know, we just use lasers for femtosecond lasers to create flops and we no longer use microkeratomes. But having that, even the incisional refractive keratotomy uh, knowledge right. is super important to really understanding how to, to, to think about the cornea. So having that, is is just that historical knowledge and that and that's another part of the benefit right you need you need to really understand the history to to understand how to move forward so yeah so you're right even though we do different things so many important lessons from back then exactly in fact one of them, like even i remember when i was a med student i worked in the lab of peter mcdonald who at the time was a faculty at usc oh. he then went down to irvine now he's chairman of wilmer yes um, we had this rabbit studies where you you'd basically do prk and rabbits this is gosh, probably mid nineties. And then we'd see which eye drops, which post-op medications would slow down epithelial healing. And so we learned from that. Like I learned from that, like, yeah, the, the aminoglycosides, like the tobermycin would slow down epithelial closure rates in those rabbits compared to let's say a fluoroquinolone. And so now recently I had a patient where I did PRK for her and uh, she's had a, a severe allergy to fluoroquinolones. So I said, ah, oh, should I put her on tobermycin? I was like, you know, probably not. Because <laughs> I remember from way back when. Exactly. It's amazing, right? It's amazing. Yeah, so technology is obviously getting better and better. Um, we're now, of course, doing all laser-based in most cases, although I used a, a, a mechanical my character to do LASIK uh, a few months ago. I had a patient with the radial keratotomy, and the cuts were so kind of wide. I was afraid if I used the femto that I'd end up separating out the, the 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 cuts from the rk so the lasik flap actually was really clean the crazy part was though it made me so bananas is that the patient was minus one in this eye and they really insisted upon being corrected to play -Doh. And i was like gosh minus one is such a gift how do you not understand this so i made them delay it for a few months until we finally did it I was like, okay. and they're super happy now Okay, so, until next year, and then they're going to be a little hyper A little hyper. But, well. <laughs> what day? What day? Hello. No, but Stop luckily. Say uh, no. 
it's okay. Okay to say no, huh? I, in that case, 100% would have convinced the patient that it's in their best interest not to do a LASIK touch-up for a minus one in an RK patient. Uh, Because consecutive hyperopia is a real thing, progressive hyperopic shift. And you're right, minus one is a gift. It's an absolute gift. And but having for you and me, but thought. sometimes patients don't get this. So, uh, you know, honestly, uh, you, 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 the point is you got to tailor to the patient. So we make all different decisions. In fact, one thing I love about you is how you will say, no, I disagree with you. I want to tell you, I love that about you. In fact, our, uh, our listeners may recognize the name, Dolly, Dr. Daliwa. Yes, from the Cataract Coach Best of Session at the ACRS, you and Rosa Bragamilia are my panelists. And I ch- choose you guys specifically because obviously you're amazing surgeons, incredibly smart, smarter than I ever was. And more importantly, are not afraid to teach me on the podium in front of everyone else about the mistakes I'm making. <laughs> you know, they we truly consider you a brother. You really are a brother from another mother. And we have so much fun doing those sessions and and it, and the learning and the the teasing and the laughter, kind of nonstop. You're absolutely right. right. And, you know, it's, it's, I I think that when you get to a certain point in your career, you realize, you know what, you just got to tell it like it is, because this is the truth, right? Like, this is really how I do things. I'm not, I used to be kind of scared to share, you know, like, oh, I'm actually, I would never do that. That sounds crazy. And, you know, (laughs) you, you kind of want to just go along with everybody else, but definitely now. Tell it like it is. I just tell it like it is because that's all I got, you know. Well, I love, and, I love you. You, yeah, you, you give advice from the heart and from the brain. You're just like, this is my heart telling me this. My brain's telling me this, this is what you should do, and I think you did it wrong. <laughs> 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 but we have fun. And you're right. It's a it's a 90 minute session of just like fun, 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 and it's it fast, is. fast pace. I love how fast it is. It's fast. You cut us off all the time, and I'm just like always thinking, oh, I hope I know what I would do in this case because you know, just so for the audience. Rosa and I never see these cases ahead of time. We are Correct. watching just like everybody else. Right. And you put us on the spot. And if we don't know the answer, you just keep on going because the video never stops. Right. So, yeah, exactly. I don't let you or Rosa see the case ahead of time. So it's all going to be absolutely surprise to the audience, plus a surprise to you. Yep. And then the other part I, I like about too is that, yeah, we time it very, very accurate. So there for this 90-minute session, there'll be nine cases each one about 10 minutes total. And then, you know, a little bit of video, then we have a discussion, a little bit of video, more discussion, what would you do? And I've actually incorporated now some audience time so audience can have Q&A. Oh. So throughout the thing, a little bit, but just a minute at a time, but you're right. I have a timer on the screen for everything. And when it says panel discussion and you have one and a half minutes, I promise when the timer goes back to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we move on. There is no stopping, no pause. That is correct. So there is no time for Rosa and I to actually think about the case or think about our answer. We just got to start talking. So it's kind of, yeah, it's quick. We got to be quick. Yeah, I definitely t- I have two cups of coffee that that morning. Two That's me too. You have to because, you know, we want to get through so much. And so what I do is I make the entire 90 minutes. There are no PowerPoint slides. The entire 90 minutes is a single video file of 89 minutes in length. So we will for sure be on time. How do you do that? Are they Does that take that's, you? And that's the right way of doing it. For presentations on the podium to stay yeah. within your time, instead of doing PowerPoint and clicking a slide and having it so variable, just having all the PowerPoint slides, everything incorporated into one video file. And okay. then you get to play, and then for sure you'll never be over. So if I'm giving a talk that's eight minutes long, I'll make a video that's like seven minutes and 45 seconds. I go on the podium and say, hit play, and I just start talking. And for sure I'll be done exactly within my time. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, one of these days, I need to have a lesson on video editing, expert video editing. Yours are always masterful, masterful. It's, yeah, not easy. I um, mean, the, the, you know, you're teaching, with a, I have to say, your videos, your teaching, and your voiceovers, perfect. I mean, I oh, learned so yes. much. And you just like, you have this cadence, and it's just fun to watch. I mean, Really, it's kind of a just just hanging out with cataract coach, you know. When, right. when there's when when you just have an extra uh, extra few minutes, it's just really really. Oh, important. thank you. Well, we're yeah. going to feature your podcast coming up on a Sunday, and then I'll give you the opportunity on the following Monday 
to have the cataract coach surgical video be about you. So which case are you going to submit to me now? You got to think about it. Oh, I already know. Tell me. I'm going to teach this super easy way to do FACO and it's called squeeze chop. And I all you heard do, of it. and I know because I made it up. So <laughs> what's squeeze chop? Squeeze chop is literally the easiest way to take out a cataract and one of the safest. And it works for almost every density of cataract. And it doesn't matter if the endothelium is about to fail or whatever, what the zonules are loose, it works everywhere. And you don't have to worry about vacuum. So all you do is you go in okay. and you, after your rexus, you do a beautiful cortical cleaving hydrodissection and hydrodelineation. Then you make one nice central groove and you crack it. Okay. Then you turn it. Um, and what you do is you take your, I just use a Drysdale cause okay. I'm still looking for something, something that I like better, but I take my, the sharp and my FACO tip. I use a 45 degree bevel FACO okay. tip and I impale it into the center of the half. Okay. And then I take my, um, Drysdale and I go around the nucleus and mm -hmm. I just bring the two together, to squeeze them together to chop, but I don't use any vacuum. There's no oh. vacuum. See, so it's just literally mechanical squeeze and then chop. And then it so just, you, just you trap the trap the hemi nucleus between the phaco tip and let's say your second instrument. Yes. And, and then you, you don't just, need to worry about vacuum even. You don't and worry you about just, vacuum. And so you just vac you just squeeze and then it chops and done. And then you take the little dry zone, flip it out, and your phaco tip stays right in the center. And then you leave that one uh quadrant intact and you turn the rest of the nucleus around so that you have uh, the stability of the capsular bag from that one remaining, uh, you know, hemi, uh, the, the quadrant. And then you do the same thing on the other half without any vacuum. And so it's like so stable. There's not as much fluid because I see right. when people try to impale it, then they're losing the piece and then they impale the, the posterior capsule sometimes. And this is so simple. So simple and boom, 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 and you're done. Right. We're gonna you gotta send me that video we'll feature it. Yeah, I think that's smart because when you do with the when you impale it with the faker probe and use high vacuum to hold the piece, the catch there is that you now have a time window of one or two seconds before you lose the vacuum. So you have a time constraint. Whereas this, there's no time constraint. Place your faco tip to hold the nucleus, just touching it, Ch chop our second dimensions around it, trap the piece between the two, and then just chop. And That's there you smart. go. Squeeze, chop. <laughs> I love it. All right, we're going to speak to that. This, this is, if you listen to the podcast, it's tomorrow's video on cataractcoach.com. You definitely got to check it out. That's fantastic. I'll, I'd love to feature that. Let me ask you another question. I have a patient coming up. Brunescent, brunescent rock. Like I'm the patient, let's say, is 85 years old. The cataract is an absolute rock, like one of the densest I've seen in my career. Patient has a, a, a corneal pachymetry of 620 microns end of the cell count of like a thousand cells per square millimeter. What do I do? Your best case, your most gentle case, whatever that is, right? So you got to bring your best game. I mean, for some people it would be M6. That's what right? I'm, I'm thinking. I'm right? just gonna for some it. people it would be that. Like if you got that in your toolbox, then pull it out, right? Because you're just going right. to, there's no FACO energy. It's going to be a beautiful case. But if for those of, for those of, of of us you know and luckily i did learn that technique and i love it and really we used to do extra caps remember so it's just a right. modification of an extra cap we all know how to do scleral tunnels it's not it's not that hard it's a beautiful technique everybody should learn it mm -hmm. but if you don't know how to do it you could use a my loop you could use a femto you can use all these different things to help you or you could just do a vertical chop right and you can get that cataract out but that when you have a a, a challenging case I think the critical thing is bring your best game. This is not mm -hmm. the time to start learning new techniques. There's not not time to like just watch all of Dr. Dave Gunn's videos and you know try to try to implement that. You really want something that you've done before so you can really do it well, right? Right. There's not many of us who can just watch and then like bring our best game the next day for a compromised cornea case, right? A lot of us, you know, it, it, you get better by doing. So you want to get yeah. a few under your belt. So that's what I would do. Yeah, I'm going to plan on doing M6 because yeah. I just, even, if, even if I chop the cataract up in the in the in the bag 
and did vertical chop, whatever else. It's still like that's a lot of fake energy for a real wimpy cornea. Exactly. So just do M6. I mean, that's that's the 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 most gentle technique in this in this situation. Plus, it's fun. <laughs> it is. It's like delivering babies, right? Like, right. It's the closest, closest thing that. we're going to get to it. Yeah. <laughs> so it is it. fun. It is fun. And again, like we were talking about, you know, it's just fun to be in training when we were still doing extra caps. Right. And right, like we were there when the FACO you know, that whole FACO wave. And we went from scleral tunnels to clear cornea to this, to that. And so, you know, when we do these complex cases, it's like, eh, been there, done that. You know, we right. have all those tools. It is it is fun. It's it's kind of joyful to bring all those tools together to help. Yeah, people. M6 is such a better procedure, though. I remember when I was a resident, seeing those extra caps with the corneoscleral scissors to the left and the right. To cut that <laughs> limbus with scissors is so barbaric. Well, I used to I used to use the the crescent to just I mean, exactly. gently enlarge, gently enlarge, and so yeah, no, hundred percent. M six is definitely better, definitely better. It's just a better incision, hundred percent. Yeah, tough tough case there. All right, I got to ask you about more cases. I'm, now that I got you here, <laughs> now tell me, tell me what, you had a very early experience with as crazy as this sounds, pediatric refractive surgery. <gasps> Oh, yes. Tell I me about that. Like you were the pioneer of this. Well, I was one of the pioneers sure. of this. And, you know, I thank you for bringing that up. I think that um, we did a study back in 1999 looking at pediatric LASIK for children who were failing amblyopia therapy. And they had basically anisometropic amblyopia. So their one eye was not so nearsighted and the other eye was severely okay. myopic. And so what we did is we did LASIK in their more myopic eye to balance the two eyes together. And uh, it took forever to get through the IRB and this and that. And we had this amazing team. We did a pilot study and we wanted to know, you know, how did these kids... How would they fare if we did that treatment? Because they were going to not yeah. see. How, they were, how, how gonna, the kids? How, how they were from ages five to eight. So how do you do the anesthesia? You've got to have some kind of anesthesia. That is correct. Well, <laughs> we did general anesthesia for these children. And uh, it was really amazing. We in the, in a, the Exmer laser suite. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So we had a an amazing team of, of anesthesiologists. I still remember Ryan Cook and Peter Davis. I went to the children's hospital and met with Ryan Cook. And I said, we're, we want to do this kind of crazy study where we're, you know, going to do LASIK in these children. We need general anesthesia at the Ion Ear Institute, not in the hospital. And he looked at me, he said, how long would it be? Da da da, this, that. He's like, sure, I can do anesthesia anywhere because he was in the military and so he was took this as a challenge and it's because of him that actually we could do this study because he was all in and so we did this study and what we learned is that you just can't use a mask okay. to anesthetize these children because i thought oh we'll just do a mask we don't have well, to do intubate them then. No, but what happened is there's too much leakage of the anesthetic mm. gases into the atmosphere and our laser shut down. Oh. So I wanted to like crawl into the earth when that was happening because, you know, our, our study was derailing. But then we learned we needed to do uh, an oral, you know, like a laryngeal mask airway. And so with that, they were able to, uh, you know, safeguard the airway and there was no, there was no leakage of the anesthetic gases and we were su successfully able to do all these children. So then we did our study and it was really, really exciting. And I followed two of them. So I saw them 16 years later and they wow. still are so happy that they had it. So um, these children did very, very well. None developed ectasia. They were relatively well centered even back then, you know, considering we did mechanical microkeratome and, right. you know, surgeon fixation, there was no auto fixation. And, right. and uh, yeah, it was a really amazing learning experience. And now I think there's still a, a, a role for this, for therapeutic refractive surgery. And, 
you know, looking at even the next step, you know, with the myopia epidemic, what can we do for these children who are rapid response, rapidly um, progressing in their myopia? Um, it turns out probably spectacles is not the best thing to give them, right? right. When you give them myopic spectacles, they just keep on getting worse and worse. So we really need all of us as refractive surgeons, as cataract surgeons, as ophthalmologists, we need to understand myopia control and we need to advocate for our, you know, for the youth, for these children who are progressing. There's there's atropine drops, there's special contact lenses that they should be in. Uh, there's, you know, orthokeratology, there's mycite contacts, there's all these things. The key is do something and be outside and play outside in the sun for at least- if, Maybe don't day. give the two-year-olds and strollers iPhones to play on all day. Um, yeah, that, that, right, 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 right. So, you know, we really, we really need to, to intervene. And so, you know, even to the point where, I mean, maybe we should be doing refractive surgery on, on younger and younger children, you know, just, just for the myopia epidemic. I mean, that's something that we're still investigating and we're right. thinking about what would be the best ablation profile. That's another subcommittee as part of ISRS is a myopia control subcommittee. And Alexander Stoyanovich is going, is leading it. So we have a lot of interesting, wow. really interesting, uh, kind of, um, subcommittees and, and these task forces that we want to implement. Yeah, if you think about it, I mean, for this, these cases of the anisometropia, it makes so much sense to, you know, even the two eyes out to stop that issue of amblyopia. 100%. They, I mean, think about these children. They're not getting the proper glasses. They're not getting proper um, just care, right? And so then they go right. to school. They can't see. They can't perform well. Their whole life Right. And then if you have anisometropia, let's say more than three diopters, even that's hard to tolerate in spectacles because the anisoconia. Exactly, exactly. And then they're going to become amblyopic, and and then you know one eye forever is is affected and problematic, and possibly you know has vision loss that could be should have been reversible. Why do you think refractive surgery in the U.S. like corneal refractive surgery is not more common? Like if you had asked me twenty years ago, I'd say it's going to become like braces for your teeth. Every kid turns about 13 or 12 or 11 years old and gets the brace on their teeth, their teeth are perfect. Why do we not have this where kids would have, okay, you're 18, 20, 21 years old, you're, you're refraction stabilized, you do your LASIK now, you're good to go till you become presbyopic in 25 years, and then you can do something in the future. Okay. Why don't we have that? Did you just read my mind? I, no. I literally would just was thinking it should be like braces. Refractive yeah. surgery should be like braces. Everybody right. gets braces and, and truly you get your teeth corrected. Why don't you get your vision corrected? Why is it not that concept? Tell me. And I'm not so, president elect of, of, of ISRS. You are. You tell me. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, you know, I, I think that we need to really think about the safety of these procedures. And do we need to wait for refractive stability for to, to intervene, right? Like, do we need to wait why do, you know, we're waiting for them to reach that peak, but if we intervened early, maybe they wouldn't peak. Maybe we could, if we intervened and did a procedure that helped them decrease the peripheral hyperopic to focus on their cornea, on their retina, maybe then they, their eyes would stop growing. Oh, that's a good point. See that? See that? So I think the key is we have to think about this more holistically and when should we intervene? I think that we all see contact lens related infections. Yeah. Every be devastating. week, every week, right. blinding contact lens related infections, right? So we know contact lenses are not the safest thing. And we know our children want to be super active. So we need to think holistically and kind of globally about this issue. And we need to establish safety. We need to establish predictability. We need to do those studies. And yes. we need to really think, you know, from first principle, like what is happening to this, to this child as they're growing and how can we, you know, affect that kind of like help them stop progressing in their myopia first so that they, they do reach that, that point where we can intervene.
Yeah, wow, such yeah, all great points. It's interesting to see what this will end up being. What uh, it'll evolve to. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, I, I think that the the field of of myopia control and refractive surgery obviously, you know, are so intertwined. And you know, to and so every single patient I see for a, a refractive surgery consult, I discuss with them myopia control for their children. Ooh. Oh, totally. Oh, that's smart. Because obviously their kids are gonna likely be myopic. Uh -huh. too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you, can, you look at you look at some cities like Singapore or Hong Kong or Taipei, where the incidence of myopia among young people is like incredible, like 80, 90 percent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, this is as as we all know right the myopia epidemic and this is how i've started to say it now you know myopia is not just a refractive condition it's a disease it is a true yeah. disease it is associated with glaucoma with yeah. myopic degeneration of the retina yeah detachment with retinal detachment right with like, earlier, earlier cataract development yeah, earlier cataract so that's a disease, like all those things that we talked about, that is a disease state. So myopia yeah. is a disease. We need to really um, start attacking this disease <laughs> in our earliest uh, form. And, and I think we really need to jump on that bag bandwagon, but, but yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, no, I think we should not let these people, you know, get to minus nines. I think we need to, to try to uh, make, you know, help them, uh, these children stop progressing. You know what? I think great points, great stuff. Yeah, interesting to see where this will end up going. We'll find out. Now, tell me also about your interest in acupuncture. People may not know. Acupuncture? Oh my gosh. Yes, I am a licensed acupuncturist. But then you did a lot of research. I'm super impressed with you. I've only known you for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, so, I became a licensed acupuncturist in 2007. Wow. And I was, you know, doing my career, going along. And I then had an acupuncture treatment and I was in the Lake Austin spa. I still remember. And I had some back issues. So I was like laying there with these needles in my back thinking, this is unbelievable, right? This discipline, 2000 years old. We yeah. are still doing the same thing. This person is sticking needles in my body to wow. affect my pain. What is this? I need to learn this. This is the coolest thing. And what are the applications for ophthalmology? So that's when I had my little epiphany okay. in Austin. And then I came back to the University of Pittsburgh and my chairman at the time was super supportive. And he's like, yes, study it. I will give you the resources and I will give you the time needed. You become a licensed acupuncturist and really then, you know, start looking at the applications in ophthalmology. So it was super, super excited. So I then studied and I did this course um, that was through UCLA and it mm. was acupuncture for MDs basically so that they accelerate the course and it was basically a year. We did about five days on site and then we did 300 hours of self-study there you go oh yeah oh yeah and then we had a final practicum that was another 10 days and that was hands-on we had to we were blindfolded and we had to find acupuncture points on a body blindfold wow wow like this was intense i had to relearn all of my musculoskeletal anatomy i was like these actually not relearn i mean these were things i had never learned like you know like these little, little prominences and these little protuberances and you know this little point is here and you learn a totally different language of the different meridia yeah. and oh my gosh talking about an amazing way to expand your mind and to just learn something totally new and just take that leap of faith right, right. of 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 this kind of eastern type of of healing methodologies and it was fabulous absolutely fabulous fabulous and the pinnacle was 
that during the last little session, we could invite patients. And can you imagine the last session happened to be in Pittsburgh? So I was so lucky. I invited my nurse, Nurse Nancy, who had her foot run over by a golf cart. Okay. And for two years, she was limping because she had so much pain. She went, she saw orthopedic surgeons, she saw chiropractors, she saw foot and ankle specialists, she saw this, that, whatever, whatever. Pain medicine people, no relief. So I invited her to come to the course and we did this acupuncture treatment in her where we stuck this needle like this long in her interosseous ligament between her tib tibia and fibula and we stuck it through there and then we stimulated it, okay, uh, mechanically. So it was like vibrating. Okay. And then she had to walk around. And you will not believe it. Her pain ended that day. Whoa, that's so amazing. And never came back. That is unbelievable. One treatment. It reset wow. her entire, all her pain receptors in her leg. It was unbelievable, right? And oh my gosh. And so then I, I learned these protocols for acupuncture for dry eye. Mm -hmm. I learned protocols for acupuncture for dry macular degeneration. And we've done pilot studies on those two things. Um, but it's powerful. Acupuncture is an incredibly powerful technique. I, I think that all of us should open our minds. Have you ever had acupuncture? Uday? Never, but I need to know what are the what are these what are the ophthalmic applications and where do you put the needles? <laughs> okay. So where do you think we put the needles? I don't know, like a retina guy, intravitreal or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. That's for glaucoma. That's the glaucoma protocol when we just stick it in the eye and let the aqueous come out. That treats glaucoma. Okay. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. So it turns out that the ear okay. and um and the finger finger uh that's where for the dry eye protocol that's where we put the needles the ear is incredibly powerful it's like kind of like a mini you know you see this like homunculus on the ear as right. as representation so some people just do auricular acupuncture and they can treat a lot of different things but anyway so that's where you put the for the for the dry eye protocol, it's in the ears and the fingers. And then for the macular degeneration protocol, there's a lot of needles. And there's some in the orbit, there's some in the scalp, and um, and it's it's pretty intense. That's a very intense protocol. What gauge are these needles? How small are these? I mean, are they, oh, they they're, see oh, they're tiny. They, they actually, so the cool thing, when we say needle, we think of a hypodermic needle where right. we're drawing blood. No, 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 no. Like you can put, you know, 20, 20 little acupuncture needles into a little hub of a hypodermic needle. They're so thin and flexible. The idea of an acupuncture needle is that actually the acupuncture needle slides between cells. It does not oh. impale the cell. So the idea of the needle is that you're putting this needle in between the cells and it's going in activating a point, an acupoint. And mm -hmm. that point will then allow your chi, QI is chi, to then become unblocked. Because mm -hmm. the concept of disease is when your chi is blocked, you form a disease. So when you can get the establishment of of chi, the flowing of the chi throughout your body, um, then you're in in a you're well. You're you don't have disease or disease. You're at ease. So you know the idea is that you want to maintain this beautiful kind of chi flowing throughout your body. And if you get a blockage and you have a disease, then you go and you you get your you know you put needles in these certain acupoints, and then you can you can kind of um, get rid of the blockage and then you get flow again. Very, and uh, like I have a little bit of a rotator cuff injury from too much weightlifting. I, got, I may want to check this out. I mean, what's the downside, right? Listen, very little downside, but here's the deal. 
you have to find somebody who is a true healer, like a very good acupuncturist. It's just like any profession, right? Mm -hmm. There's some people who are really good and there's other people who may not be so good, right? And so you can't just go to one and say, oh, acupuncture doesn't work. I went, it's useless, da, da, da. Yeah. You have to really, you know, do your research, find out who's, who's getting great results. And if you do find a true healer, it's like magic. It is absolutely wow. like magic how, you know, how powerful the technique is. And I've witnessed some of these things and it's truly, truly mind boggling. Boy, I like your story of Nurse Nancy. Wowza. Uh, no, right? So we started the Center for Integrative Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh, and we started that back in 2007. So it's exciting that, you know, we talk to our patients about all these kind of holistic ways to treat disease, not just, you know, take the, the restasis. Um, you know, we talk about behavior modification. We talk about um, diet. We talk about, you know, all these different things because really, we need to take a step back and think about our patients as people. Not just not eyeballs. Just, not just two little eyeballs, right? And sometimes we only think of one little eyeball, but you know, I, I always step back and I and I always freak people out. Cause so there's another thing I wanna I wanna um share with you, Ude. Um, because I know if I say it here, like millions of people are gonna know this all of a sudden. So this is fantastic. This is my other thing that I'm trying to get out there. So there is a condition called like nasal lash deviation. Okay. And what that is, okay. you're going to notice this now when you look at your patients and you should have them look up, down, left, right. And then when you're looking at the slit lamp, you have them close, you know, close their eyes and you're looking at their lashes. You're going to see that some people's lashes, instead of coming down, they're going this way towards the nose. Do you know okay. why that is? No because they're sleeping with pressure on their eye oh. all night and oh. their lashes are getting pushed over and they're putting too much pressure on their eye and their lashes literally are pushed over. Oh, so in a, yes. And in addition, they're probably causing more keratoconus on that side and maybe even optic nerve damage by the pressure going up at night. Wow, I never even thought of that. That's so wild. Uh-huh. Learn so, something new every day. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, yes, indeed. So the nasal lash deviation, now that I told you about it, you're going to see, see it in everybody. So what I do is when I see my patients, I, you know, I always do that external eye exam, up, down, left, right, because, you know, you can see those floppy eyelids, mm -hmm. highly associated with, you know, keratoconus, et cetera, sleep apnea. So I always do that external exam. And then I tell the patient which side they sleep on. And they're probably blown away. Like what? They're freaked out. They're like already, they're thinking, okay, this lady is serious. She's stalking me at night. She's a little scary. I better tell her the truth. Right. And so, but then we, we talk more and, and really, I mean, some people, I have to give them a shield to wear at night. And they've, oh, yeah. and it's changed their pathology. Like they wake wow. up and they don't have pain or they wake up and they don't have blurred vision. They wake up and they, you know, have, have so much of a better, you know, situation first thing in the morning. Cause they're not smushing their eye all night. Oh, I gotta look at this now, especially the patients where like you see keratoconus, but it's way more in one eye versus the other eye. Yes. Makes you wonder. Exactly. And that's, you know, been, been the sleep position and keratoconus definitely has been associated, but not the lashes. Like the lashes are just telling you the whole story. That's why the nasal lash deviation. Boom. You, you've always been one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. I just, let me tell you, for people who don't know, I mean, you hammered through undergrad and med school Northwestern in like, I don't know, like three weeks, you did all of them, both degrees. <laughs> You're like a super. You're like a superstar. You, I learned so much from you. Oof, that is fantastic. Well, I will look for that. That's actually a really great little trick, a little pearl there. That's an interesting thing. It's so easy to see, and once you yeah. start looking for it, I'm telling you, the residents, the fellows, 
they they say to me they're like this is so obvious once you know what you're looking for it's like boom literally like slap you in the face obvious every time and then we just start documenting it and we're doing actually a prospective study um at the university of pittsburgh looking at this sign how it's correlated with keratometry and optic nerve the nerve so cool. wow what? i always learn so much from dp ah, such oh, a pleasure man. talking to you it's, it's both ways a day uh, well, well i'm gonna learn even more at this ascs meeting when i show you these crazy <laughs> cases and you're gonna say you say what are you doing no you should do it differently uh, <laughs> just say no yeah for just sure say no. well i want to thank you for doing this podcast i really had a fantastic time talking to you as always so much to learn i'm going to feature your video about squeeze and chop tomorrow if you listen to the podcast live it'll be that monday video please send that over thank you again i will oh they time's up already that was so fast is this too much fun or time flies you're having fun oh my gosh well thank you for being literally the best teacher in our field oh you're too you sweet. truly or they deserve every teaching award out there because you impact more people than anybody else on this earth so thank you for teaching all of us forever oh thank you remind our viewers and listeners new podcast every week on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, YouTube, anywhere you find podcasts, you find the Cataract Coach Podcast. And check out our website for a free daily video. And DP's video is tomorrow. Come learn more from Cataract Coach and Dr. Dollywall, who again will be joining us with Dr. Rosa Bragamili for the best of Cataract Coach session at the ASCRS meeting in Boston on Saturday, April 6th at 8 a.m. sharp. We got a full 90 minutes of amazing cases and audience interaction too. I promise you'll learn a lot.